Hi everyone, Jess here, and today I'm joined with Sir Tim Clark, President of Emirates. Thank you for joining me today. Good to be here. So firstly, as we return to normal in the wake of the pandemic, what are the greatest challenges the industry is now starting to face? Uh, readjusting to, to the trauma of the last few years, um, resetting networks, resetting fleet, etc. Um, and we're, we're about 90% there, I would say. So it's been tough over the last couple of years, but not just for the airline industry, for everybody. Um, and uh, going forward, well, the stronger will get stronger. That's great to hear. And when it comes to passenger expectations, how are you proactively anticipating changes in these to ensure that your experience remains at the forefront of the industry? Well, it's an interesting, uh, interesting series of developments post COVID. One, the market resilience has been incredible uh, and it seems to be, as far as we can see, well sustained. So the people that were traveling with us and in the industry continue to travel um, as much as they did, paying much, much higher prices, which gives you some idea of the price elasticities or inelasticities of the uh, demand for travel. We can't see really an end to it. Um, the, the leisure business is, is incre increasing significantly. Uh, and you look at, the, for instance, here we are in, in uh, Portugal, Lisbon, and you look at the inbound tourism for uh, Portugal in the last year or so, it really has gone into sort of double digits and, and is growing at pace. So this is not peculiar to Portugal, it's all over the world. Um, and in Emirates, we have very high seat factors. We have very high seat factors for the next six and nine months, as far as we can see in the long-term forecasting. So the customer experience then is a question of adapting to what we always did in the past. I've, I've, one of my main mantras in the business was to go north rather than south. In other words, we started to chuck more at the product, uh, the tactile physical product, which is what we do in the planes, in the cabins with the crew, etc. Invest more in the back of the house stuff. A lot of this uh, uh, work today is all about the digital side of things, artificial intelligence. We're accelerating our our. Um, are sort of inroads into that kind of thing but it's you know at the, at the heart of it you have to remember that you're dealing with the human being um, and it's very much a question of keeping well focused on that laser focused people ask me what do you think people are going to want what how do you think they're going to develop what how are you going to harness that etc etc and I have very simple views with regard to that and it's the way the Emirates has always been that way we concentrate on developing a range of products which is hugely popular, not just a group of people or a segment of people, but for everybody. Secondly, we are laser focused on how we develop the network and the fleet that fits to that network and the type of aeroplanes we use and where we use it. So we're very, very well skilled now in holding to the fourth decimal place what we do and how that fits in with the requirements of the public that travels. So we don't design a fleet or a network for the sake of it. We look very carefully at where people are going, why they're going, what they're doing, and who they are. This is where we get all the digital stuff which we've never had before. And that informs us into the way we go in the future. Um, and, and that's something that uh, encourages me, frankly. So you have a reputation as an industry visionary. What insights can you share on how airlines can forge a resilient future? Well, look, that's... Um, that's a difficult one. You know, you, you, you don't get into this industry uh, believing that it's you can make a fast buck and that it's easy. It's hard. You need all the skills of the human resource, the, the right people. After all, like most businesses, you're only as good as your people that make it work for you. Don't ever believe that unless it's some god sent um, benefit that you get. Bus good businesses are built by good people. And if you enter the airline business, whichever segment you are in full service, low cost, whatever, um, consider the position carefully uh, before you invest and lose larger amounts of money because there have been quite a few failures in our business going forward. But the most important thing is, is I guess you've got to look at exactly what it is that you think you should be doing, that one, that's one thing, two, that you're going to be better at it than the competition, who by the way have been at it for a long time, um, if you were to be as 
bold to take on, say, Ryanair and EasyJet in low cost in Europe, well, good luck to you because these people are masters of what they do. Um, but if you, if you are so determined and you really want to make a go of it, then you have to have the passion to do it, assemble the right group of people to do it, define exactly what you want to do. Um, and, and as I use these two words all the time, laser focus, laser focus, laser focus, never deviate from what you've set out to do unless there is a, if you've made a complete howler, perhaps you shouldn't have gone in the first place. But there are all sorts of tools, tricks of the trade, which you can use uh, to expand your business. But the most important thing is you've got to hit the spot. After all, we are a business that looks after and takes people from A to B. They don't come on us because they want to have a jolly good time, although I like to think on our, on our 380s they do. And lots of people tell me, well, we actually start a holiday with you on the 380. But it's a derived demand. So you've got to know why people are wanting to go, where the growing segments are, where you can fit a niche, find a niche and get into it. And then you've got to passionately hard work, long hours to get it done. This is not something you can make money easily. But it can be done. And here we are in the you know 2023 and we have um, a lot of changes in the business coming forward, a lot of things that are going to make life more difficult for us, I think, sustainability, etc. But if you can deal with all of that and you know what you're doing and you know what, where you want to be and what kind of market you want to serve, that's fine, get on with it. But be careful. So the industry is not for the faint-hearted? <laughs> well, basically, yes. It's, uh, it's uh, as I said, these days the barriers to entry are are quite difficult uh, for, for startups and many of the startups we've seen have been casualties over the last few years so um, as you say not for the faint-hearted. And it's difficult to talk about the future without speaking about sustainability so how do you view the role of governments and regulatory bodies in supporting the industry's journey towards net zero? Confusion um, you know a lot of them the governments are all saying and doing the right thing. We've got COP28 coming up in Dubai in a couple of months' time. Uh, I think a lot of, about 100 heads of states are coming. So they, they are all well-meaning and they understand what the issues are and what needs to be done about it. The f question is how and when and, and with what. Uh, with what, you know, what tools, what money, etc., etc. And, you know, everybody talks the talk. But walking the talk is a little bit more difficult. And, and I do think, though, that having said all of that, that since 2006 when Al Gore came up with his incon Inconvenience Truth, which kind of brought focus to the whole thing, the, the world has done an awful lot of good things, which we, we don't have taken stock of. There's no inventory to say how well and what we've, we've done, simply because you know, the population continues to grow on the planet, and it will grow. Um, demand for all sorts of things will continue. You look at the riot that's been all over the world when they brought out the iPhone 15 or whatever it was the other day. Um, the pursuit of all the nice things in life has gone, hasn't been, uh, let's say, has gone unabated. The, the upstream costs of building iPhones and having them discarded with all the toxic bits and pieces that gone into it doesn't seem to appear in the narrative. It's an indication that people still want more. They, they, they are aware of their environmental footprint, but, and that's something they never did before, which is one of the big gains on the planet. The third world, the developing world, is it's more difficult. And, uh, you know, we, we, if we're going to crack this problem, then that's, that's really got to be dealt with, uh, not just in the aviation industry. But, and so governments have got to come together and say how they're going to do it. Yesterday or the day before, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister of the UK, said that they should introduce some kind of carbon tax or tax for the oil-producing nations. All these kind of things are coming out. Whether or not they'll ever get enacted, I don't know. In the meantime, beneath all of that, Businesses and communities are getting on with the job of mitigating carbon footprints. And uh, I think that's quite a good thing, um, but it doesn't come into the, the mix. It's all, it's all about headline grabbing stuff about what they're going to do, and what they're not going to do. But all the time, the humans, mankind is now aware of what it's doing to the planet and how it, if it carries on in this manner, then that's good. But then we go back to the iPhone, yeah. you know? And then you come up with a new electric car and, or you come up with a new washing machine or something like that and watch what happens. So how do you mitigate the aspirations, the avariciousness of mankind and balance that against what has to happen? It's a difficult one.
Absolutely, it seems like there's a real paradox between people who want to do the right thing but they don't necessarily We're human. Want to pay more to We're do We're human. It. The human is a complex animal. Complex. <laughs> and this event is all about driving innovation and driving progress. What do you think will be the defining characteristics of the future of air travel? Again, you're talking to somebody who's been in it for over 50 years now and I've watched air travel evolve from the piston engine aircraft to where we are today. Um, are people going to want more? Are they going to stop travelling? Are they going to be more selective about what they do? It's very difficult to say, but I would say that this time in five years' time, this time in ten years' time, this time in twenty years' time, you will still see larger numbers of aircraft flying around carrying people from A to B because they want to go there. This was all, to an extent, caused by the mid-90s digital revolution, the age of information, and, for the, and, and the way we've gone about in the airline business and hospitality, our distribution network. So we, we now talk to the individual, whereas we went through intermediaries, I've been one of these passionate entities, people who want to disintermediarise our business because others, the intermediaries have been sucking value from us. Um, so with the with technology moving at the pace it was, we're able to now talk to people on the individual, you'll, you'll hear about personalisation, um, genome uh, structures, artificial intelligence, so we're getting much better at dealing with the markets and as we do that we become more fine-tuned in our understanding of you and me traveling on aeroplanes and why we do it the better we will come at doing that job so the airlines will become far more efficient in identifying their markets and and fitting the the capacity they need to the demand um, and so it, it's a, for me I think we're all, <laughs> again it's a paradox notwithstanding sustainability and the big notwithstanding cyber and all the other, as we introduce more and more technology the threats from bad actors continue to grow but on the but put that aside do I see uh, uh, a prosperous efficient fuel efficient sustainable uh, entity going forward at the airline industry yes I do I think we're going to be much better at what we do than we have been in the past a lot of guesswork in the past I and mean, I used to work on slide rules when I was in a planning job and the old day log tables long since gone now and banging out didn't have electronic calculators but in those days we used to have an idea and we'd take that idea and we'd evolve it to the fourth decimal place well the idea might have been completely a complete howler but that's what we did now there's no excuse we have enough information and I, I don't mean that about individuals because you mustn't you must be aware of um, your um, data, uh, privacy rules, etc. But we can construct using AI, and we've been doing it for a long time, it's, it's suddenly as if AI has suddenly become the thing. We've been using AI in the company for about 10 years now, more. It's just that computing power has allowed us, because it's growing at such a pace, to be able to use that data, those data lakes, the data sets, in a much more meaningful, more focused manner. So I'm kind of optimistic going forward that with all the things that you see here in this gathering and there are many of these or you know I don't want to I don't want to sort of wreck it but there's this there is an industry growing around this so the support front support functions infrastructure to the airline industry is, is much better than it ever has been so it's a good story fantastic well thank you so much for joining me today I really appreciate you taking you're welcome time.